Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining. Uh, my name is Surya Dev. I am the Vice Chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And it's my great pleasure to join uh, all of you and I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of all the organizers. The objective of this opening plenary session with the thought leaders is to not only merely look at the last one decade of the UN guiding principles and the next one decade, it wishes to look at the broader context of business and human rights last 30, 40 years, so perhaps going back in history a couple of centuries back and also looking ahead next 20, 30, 50 years where we want to go in this particular context. Uh, this is my great pleasure that I'll be moderating this uh, panel of thought leaders, very distinguished, all of them, and I'm going to introduce them in a second, but very briefly about the format of this session. The format of the session is more like a dialogue. I will have a range of questions that I'm going to ask to each of these panelists, and then they will respond briefly to those questions. I will strongly encourage all of you to post questions and I will pick those questions and pose those to these panelists as well, right? So with these remarks, let me introduce the uh, four distinguished panelists. We have uh, Professor Diana Basul. She's a professor at uh, Asian Institute of Management and also the executive director of Ramon Deal uh, Rosario's Center for Corporate Responsibility. Diana, welcome. And thank you for joining. Then we have yes, sorry, Professor Olivia de Schutter, uh, who is a professor at University of Leuven and also a UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Uh, Olivia, thank you for joining and a very good morning. It's very early in Europe, so thank you. We very much appreciate you waking up so early for us. Uh, then we have uh, Ms. Theonila Roca Matbu. She is uh, the Cabinet Minister for Education in the new autonomous Bougainville government. And she is also a complainant against Rio Tinto for the environmental degradation. Theonila, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on this panel. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Usha Ramanathan. She is a well-known human rights activist and recipient of the 2018 Access Now Human Rights Heroes Award. So, Usha, thank you once again and welcome. All right, so after this brief introduction of uh, the four distinguished panelists, uh, let me straight away start with the questions. Uh, Usha, if I can start with you. And I think my question to you is that you have been working in this space of business and human rights or so responsible business conduct for many years. What have you witnessed in the last 30, 40 years? I mean, the issues have been quite widespread, right? Uh, whether it's about toxic environmental pollution, the rights of the tribal and indigenous communities, sweatshops, you know. So if you look at this old landscape of last 40, 50 years, the business and human rights field, what has been the experience of rights holders in these different domains? You have the floor, Usha. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Surya. Uh, just as by way of introduction, I think I'll just state some of the things that we have, uh, you know, that, we, that have been the concern over the past 30, 40 years. The first thing is the rise of what we call the development state. So the state undertakes this project of development. And this is a phenomenon that has existed you know, from I think your voice is breaking somehow. So I don't know whether we need to turn off the video to make it better. I don't know. Okay, I don't know that. Because I cannot hear you at least. Is this better? I cannot still hear you well. Can can you try again now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? I think uh, hear me now. Unfortunately, it's still breaking a bit. Uh, I suspect it's in your room. The others are going to hear me. So oh, so others can hear you? The other panelists can hear you? 
Okay, then please proceed because somehow there is because we are on different platforms, so unfortunately I cannot hear you. But please proceed. Okay. So the, the first, the first uh, kind of thing that I want to introduce into the discussion is the idea of the development state, developmental state, where the state is undertaking a project of development, and that has been one of the ways where the idea of development has been among the most contested. Uh, whether the panelists can hear her? Oh, so I think that the people who are on the WebEx, they can hear her. But people who are on this different platform, they cannot hear her. So I think there's some technical issue when you're mixing the two, it seems, in the system. So it's not perhaps uh, an issue on the part of Usha. It is an issue in the team mixing up these two platforms because WebEx people, the other panelists can hear. Sorry, we have. Uh, sorry for these technical issues. Uh, so my apologies to all the uh, listeners and participants. Uh, I, I can try to uh, start with uh, Olivia in the meantime. Uh, let's give it a go if that works better. Ol Olivia, should we try that? in case so so let us say if the technique uh, technical team could figure out this issue at the usha's end uh, or that is a common issue but olivia let me start with you uh, you have also worked uh, in this space of business and human rights both inside the un system and as an outside academic for a very long time uh, very remarkable contributions i'm a great fan of your scholarship and writings so if you can uh, focus uh, on the last two decades, what progress have we made in the last two decades in promoting this uh, business respect for human rights and corporate accountability? Are you satisfied with this progress, uh, Olivia, and the scale of the progress? Over to you. Thank you. Maybe on mute, Olivia. No, I, I, I did. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. I can hear Perfect. you now. Great. No, so good morning to all. My, my great pleasure to be here. And thank you, Surya, for your question. I think it's, it's fair to summarize the developments over the past few decades by saying that we've been going through four big phases in this discussion on the relationship of companies to human rights. First, in the mid-1970s, there was an attempt to manage the post-colonial the post order. In fact, to legitimize the division of labor between uh, Western-based companies that had a global reach and that sought to exploit the resources in the global south in a context in which following the independencies of the 1960s um, in, in Africa, the 1950s in, in Asia, um, uh, these countries had recently claimed their political independence. And it is in this context that the OECD uh, adopted the, the guidelines on multinational enterprises, that in the ILO, the tripartite principles on social policy were adopted uh, to basically reassure um, the governments in the Global South, in these recently decolonized countries, that uh, Western-based companies would behave according to a certain standard of conduct to basically reassure these governments that um, there would be real consequences um, from their independence uh, that would uh, respect their economic sovereignty. In the 1980s and, and, and the 1990s, things changed quite dramatically as a result of the expansion of globalization. Um, trade expanded, uh, investment flows increased, as a result of free trade agreements, of investment treaties being concluded. And of course, this was accelerated after 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall and um, uh, the shift to a market economy of many planned economies uh, that were functioning according to socialist principles. The privatization process that characterized this period 
also led to a very significant increase in the weight of um, global multinational companies um, and global supply chains. And the reaction came around 2000 with the Global Compact and with uh, uh, the idea that we needed to tame globalization. The Global Compact was something very new because it was the first UN initiative that did not involve governments. It was purely private sector based. Only companies adhered to these nine, now 10 principles. Uh, Anti-corruption was added in 2004. And the Global Compact um, was an attempt to share good practices. It was really nothing more than a, a, a platform by which companies would mutually exchange about their practices in this area and learn from one another. And then we are now entering since 2011 with the guiding principles on business and human rights, a fourth phase, which is much more normative in which we move away from learning, uh, a learning platform, the sharing of good practices to a normative approach in which companies are expected to comply with certain human rights requirements. The big difficulty, however, is that human rights have been designed for states, that corporations have no territory, they do not exercise jurisdiction, they don't have sovereignty. And so the big challenge, intellectual challenge, is how to translate requirements designed and imagined for states to the activities of corporations. And it is an intellectual challenge, it's also a, a political challenge, how to make sure that the, um, the imposition of human rights norms to, to companies will be effectively informed in a context in which states are either unwilling or in some cases unable to really enforce those norms on corporate actors. So that is what I would um, uh, say is a summary of what's happened over the past few decades. And I think um, we now should move to something else. We should move to a, a, a situation in which we identify the specific requirements that we can expect corporations to comply with beyond the human rights that uh, states are expected to comply with. What are the specific um, exigencies we can express towards uh, corporate actors? And, and perhaps we can discuss the future um, in further questions uh, as we move forward in this dialogue. Thank, thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, I think that quick uh, looking back uh, from the uh, from the attempt to draft uh, a code of conduct at the UN level, uh, the decolonization to globalization, the global compact, uh, and the guiding principles and the way forward. So you have done uh, quite quite a quick summary and overview of that. So that is uh, that is excellent. Uh, I would like to now try to go back to Usha again, Usha. I think you already know the question. The question is, uh, from an activist perspective, uh, how do you see it from the last 30, 40 years? Uh, what is the experience of rights holders in different domains? So business and human rights, let us try if you can uh, connect now. You have the floor, thank you. Yeah, so uh, like I said earlier, I think the way in which we've thought about it is about the developmental state because it is the project of development that the states have embarked upon, upon post-colonization uh, in independent states, needing to be self-sufficient, needing to be able to provide for the whole population. That has been one of the major uh, ways in which we have seen the uh, state thinking move. And as a result, we've seen that you know, it has impacted on people in various kinds of ways. So while the state's development project has moved on, what it has done to the uh, lives of people has been significantly different. So the experience of affected communities, and so we have this idea of project affected communities, which has developed along with the idea of, of the developmental state. So you have questions of land, of resources, including mineral resources, of water, of forest, many of these spilling over from colonial times into post-colonial uh, context. So it has carried on the idea that for the development project, land can be taken by the state, water can be diverted from people to whatever, wherever they need it, forests can be captured by the state and used for what it considers development purposes. 
uh, militants belong with the state and they can do what you know what they want with it. This has created huge amounts of conflict situations. It's also produced some remarkable laws, changes in the law. Uh, so we can come back to that whenever. And I think uh, Olivia has done a great job for us by telling us quickly about the idea of privatization of the market and of globalization and how that has shifted many of these, uh, you know, many of the spots where we would normally recognize issues. In that, perhaps one more addition that I might make is that this period, this privatization, for instance, has meant that state acts as an agency through whom uh, public resources are privatized. And that has been a huge area that we need to look at because privatization is towards profit, but privatization is also away from the public. So the shift from seeing the public not as the people, but public as the state, as the government, has been one of the ways in which you know, our thinking has got impacted. So that now one of the very important things that's happened in, in, in international uh, uh, you know, standard setting is the idea of complicity. Earlier, for instance, when land in, it came in the context of land, where land would be taken away for a project and handed over to a corporation for them to do what they, you know, whatever they were setting out to do. Uh, there would be protests, there would be dissent, there would be conflict, and you would have the state cracking down on that conflict, multiple uh, rights being violated, and the corporation would say, well, I didn't do that. They just gave me the land so that I can, you know, I can carry on with my project. I think that got completely exploded in the 90s and the early knots of uh, this year, of this century. Uh, one other thing is the, so this is, you know, this is the developmental state. The developmental state also went into various kinds of industry. And one of those which has caused huge amounts of problems with very little answers is uh, toxic industry. And we had the awful experience that we we'll keep saying, you know, our first 1984 was with the Bhopal gas disaster. And our second 1984 is with the technology companies that have come up now. So in our first 1984, we found it was, uh, you know, they kept referring to this as the Hiroshima and Nagasaki of industry and disasters. And that's the kind of damage that we saw. I think we need to acknowledge that very little has happened in taming this aspect. In fact, it is a risk that people are asked to take all the time. We have not seriously considered minimizing risk. We've not looked at changing the process of development so that people are not perpetually at risk. And we must remember, I think, that it is the Bhopal gas disaster that produced an orphan's colony and a widow's colony. It should make us pause and not allow for this kind of development to carry on. And disasters have continued. So we can we can come back to this. Uh, I don't think Bhopal ever gets forgotten, but Bhopal can sometimes be a conversation stopper because it's so egregious that you can't say anything more. But I just want to say this, that toxic incidents are happening everywhere. And the, you know, the uh, picking up toxicity from one place and putting it in another place where there is where the regime is lighter, where there's no liability, where pollution norms are you know, not so stringent. This has become the blight of the developing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Usha, for uh, highlighting this uh, and putting serious question marks on this whole idea of economic development and development for whom, right? And are these governments uh, representing the people, the masses, the 80% of the population when they're deciding certain projects? So I think these are very legitimate questions and thank you for asking those questions. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right, uh, like the ship breaking industry. So these uh, European companies are uh, exporting those old ships to South Asia for breaking. So the, the, the toxic industry that you were talking about is not merely the chemicals industry, right? It could also be a ship shipping industry, which may not appear to be toxic, but when the old ships have to be dismantled by these workers, by their hands, with, with, with no safety gears in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in India, that is another kind of toxic situation, right? So thank you very much. Uh, I would invite uh, the participants to uh, put questions uh, in the function that you may have uh, and those questions will come to me and I'm going to ask those questions to the panelists. Please do that. 
Uh, in the meantime, I would like to now move on to uh, Theonila. Uh, Theonila, uh, the, uh, you, you have been part of this uh, Bougainville community for many years in uh, Papua New Guinea. So if you can share with us, uh, the Penguina mine is known for its role in triggering a decade-long civil war in Bougainville in the 1980s and 1990s. Can you tell us about how the environmental problems created by this mine are still impacting the communities in Bougainville today? And, and participants, we recorded a video for uh, Theonila to answer this question because we were not sure about her internet. So we will play the video now. But uh, Theonila, if you would like to add anything more, uh, I will give you the floor after the video. Okay, so let us watch the first video first. On behalf of the mine impacted communities, clans and families, I would like to first of all extend my gratitude to the United Nations Forum and Human Rights for this opportunity given for me to hear the hand-head voices of my people. My name is Tionila Waka Mathbob. I come from the Vasikan clan in central Bougainville, which is one of the four main clans in the impacted and detached community of Wansa Nomol, Panguna, which was enjoyed since time in memorial until the coming of Panguna mine operation. Under the banner of development, Rio Tinto arrived on Bougainville. They reached agreement with the Australian colonial administration to build a mine, which we, the indigenous people of Bougainville, never had a say in the decision making. We were at the receiving end of this venture and had no idea of what the impact would have been like for the people in the 60s and now to the generations that are yet to come. The mine destroyed mountains and filled rivers with billion tons of waste. Its impact was so great and they caused the uprising of what is known as the Bougainville tenure civil unrest. The war is over but the impacts continue. The mine tailings continue to wash into our rivers. My own village, Makosi, is just downstream of the mine pit and the water that runs by our house is bright blue from copper. But the situation further downstream is even worse the impacts goes far and wide. Even as I speak, new areas of untouched land downstream from the mine is being flooded with mine waste. As the waste fills up Jabba River, it breaks its banks, flooding new areas. This is destroying poor forest and land areas that sustain my people's everyday lives. The communities in those areas live in continual danger of having their homes washed away every time the river floods. Sacred sites used by our people to communicate with our ancestors are being destroyed. All our communities live with worry of the unknown health impacts of living in this polluted environment all along the tailings, you see children and people with sores on their legs and feet from the polluted river. Many people don't have access to other clean water sources for drinking and bathing. My people continue to feel the physical, spiritual, cultural and mental impacts as well as the economic impact of the mind. This is not just a legacy. It is an ongoing human rights disaster for my people. And this is why we, the communities, last year brought a human rights complaint against Rio Tinto into Australia for these impacts. 
Thank you very much, uh, Theonila. And I think your video connects very well with what Usha was highlighting earlier, the model of development. And what your case study in Bougainville highlights that the, the communities on the ground, they are not really benefiting from this model of development. Rather, these are some other actors who are benefiting from this model of development, and they do not have the say in the decision-making process. I wonder um, if you want to add anything more at this particular stage, if your internet allows that, uh, before I move on to the next uh, question to the next panelist. Okay, thank you, Suya. I think I'll be just able to just head a little bit on what um, the, I mean, I've presented via the video, as a way of just summarizing what um what has been presented you know like how olivier was saying initially these are the impacts that you know like for those of us at the receiving end especially people who are said to be or told through the government organizations that we provide promote human rights that our rights has to be protected but in the actual fact when it comes to business and corporations doing their work in partnership with indigenous groups of group of people throughout the world not just in in melanesia um it takes that especially when the corporate companies come into our communities the first thing the first tool that was used especially for my community is the colonization through the colonization platform control was imposed so with the control coming in we then eventually the business corporations control the government the colonial administration to legislate the way the companies will do their work to the best interest of the companies and not of the people so you know as as time goes on these are the issues but when the people feel the the realities of the human rights abuse and we start to retaliate against the system they will charge us against the law saying that it's not legislated here you are a criminal even though you're defending your own resources your water your land and then the future of your own children you will be charged against the very law that the companies will use the government to say that it's not legislated here and that indigenous people's rights are not here so there's a kind of struggle especially in bougainville bougainville is is really strong on our I mean, the companies that have come into Bougainville, specifically Rio Tinto and Bougainville Copper Limited, to take up the responsibility because you created the mess, you clean up your own mess because how people were not part of the whole process of destroying what is the resources which we the people need to sustain our lives as human beings. I think that's basically what I can add as a way of summarizing the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Theonila, once again. And I think uh, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights and all the UN agencies, and I'm sure uh, Olivia as a special rapporteur on poverty and human rights would agree with me. Uh, we try to bring these case studies and the community's experiences to these events and forums, not to name and shame a particular company. But these are concrete examples through which we can see what has happened, what we have gone through in terms of the rights holders, and what is the way forward? What should companies do differently going forward? And when we talk about the development, whose development are we talking about? And of course, the issues of uh, climate change are going to become more uh, prominent as we go forward. Okay, so I haven't yet received any questions. Uh, if it was my class, uh, I, I would... Uh, pinpoint uh, people and students in my class but i can't see the participants and audience so i will encourage once again <laughs> all of you to ask questions to the panelists uh, and now i would like to go to the uh, fourth panelist uh, so dina uh, you have engaged with uh, un agencies with the governments with the businesses uh, and different stakeholders uh, in your career so in your judgment, in your assessment, do you believe that this idea of responsible business conduct, this has become mainstreamed? And I'm interested in this both on paper and in practice. What is your assessment of that? And when you talk to businesses, 
what strategies have you found effective in encouraging them to take human rights seriously? Diana, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for this question, Surya. And let me just begin uh, that in our work at the Center for Corporate Responsibility, we believe in fostering an enabling environment for responsible businesses to thrive by engaging an ecosystem of stakeholders from various sectors, corporates, of course, but also public, regulatory development, and so on. And in, to answer your question, while we were engaging with the private sector, we did see companies embedding responsible practices systematically within their operations. And during COVID, we have seen the same companies doubling down and supporting not just their customers and employees, but also their suppliers. But these are mostly the larger conglomerates, the likes of Ayala or San Miguel groups here in the Philippines, or those organizations whose leaders have made a commitment to being responsible businesses as a priority. The other companies still equated responsible business conduct with CSR activities, mainly towards the environment and their communities. And while these CSR activities have become more strategic recently, unfortunately, during COVID, these companies have scaled back because they had to go into survival mode. And this is sad because uh, companies scaling back feels like we are taking two steps back after having taken one step forward. And like what was mentioned earlier, we only have 10 years left to achieve uh, the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And a recent study, 2020, by scholars from Cambridge has actually indicated that the Philippines is actually only uh, on track to achieve two out of the 17 goals. And so I guess the question now is how do we make responsible business conduct by companies towards their stakeholders a matter of survival? And like you said, in our engagement with government, government ministries through the OECD and ILO's Responsible Supply Chains in Asia project, we were actually encouraged by the leadership of agencies to support responsible business conduct through their policies. In particular, the Securities and Exchange Commission has recently implemented a sustainability reporting policy for all publicly listed companies in the Philippines. What this means is that for the largest companies here in the Philippines, reporting on sustainability or responsible business practices is now mandatory along with their financial disclosures. And as stakeholders start relating the information gleaned from the sustainability reports to a company's legitimacy to operate as a business, at least for the publicly listed companies, responsible business conduct may become a matter of survival to secure customers, investors, creditors, suppliers, and even employees. But while such regulatory framework can definitely hasten, the mainstreaming of responsible business conduct. In reality, even some of our biggest publicly listed companies have just started the, on their journey towards responsible business conduct. And while I agree with uh, Olivier that we have to start on the normative side, right? The, for developing countries like the Philippines, it is still an effective strategy to encourage companies to stay on this course by having safe havens like these where we can honestly and openly discuss not just the practices, but also the challenges and barriers as they relate to responsible business conduct. Because we do not just want companies to become adept at reporting on paper their sustainability practices. Rather, we want companies to exert effort in practicing responsible conduct, including human rights of their stakeholders and to communicate such efforts, success, successful or not yet, through their sustainability reports. Also, an important point to achieve a larger impact for companies is to start partnering with their suppliers, especially the smaller ones, to encourage them in the spirit of partnership and not, in, not of compliance to undertake the same journey towards respecting human rights of their stakeholders. And such a partnership approach of supporting suppliers to incorporate responsible business over is, is a, over a punitive one, 
like dropping them as suppliers for non-compliance, has been shown to be more effective at encouraging companies to take human rights more seriously. Let me just add by saying that in enabling the business environment for responsible businesses to thrive, let us look at it from a bigger ecosystem of relationships and what each of us can do to lift the others in reaching the goal of responsible businesses that respects the human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. And uh, interestingly, I think uh, my challenge has triggered some questions. So I'm getting now several questions. So thank you very much, participants, for raising these questions. Uh, and, and, and the dear panelists, uh, I'm going to randomly throw those questions to you, and you will have some time to think about it. And of course, if you think you are not the right person to answer that question, perhaps some other panelist can jump in. But I will exercise my discretion in throwing those random questions to all four of you. I hope you don't mind. The first question I get is that should the business model of profiting shareholders should be reviewed to ensure the rights holders be protected? So it's basically a question I would like to put to Olivia. Uh, shareholder primacy model, do we need to question that? Uh, you still can think about your response, Olivia, but that is a question I would like you to answer. Uh, Dinah, a question that perhaps you may try to answer is that what kind of incentives in, in your uh, presentation, you highlighted the issue about big companies, mixed picture, some doing CSR, some doing good sustainability disclosure, uh, some companies going backwards because of the COVID survival mode and all this. There's a big issue in Asia Pacific about SMEs small and medium enterprises there's a big issue about informal economy how do we create incentives for smes for the informal economy on this particular point that is something that is relevant a question for theonila uh, that i'm going to uh, if you want to answer that question is what can un agencies do to help indigenous communities because remember in your video you talked about the communities in bougainville had no say in participation of this development project right so what would you like the government or the un agencies to do whenever those public private partnerships are unfolding uh, including in relation to the uh, free prior and informed consent and i'm sure uh, usha would also like to come to this issue of tribal people and free prior and informed consent uh, so I think that is uh, uh, my uh, kind of uh, reflections at this point of time. And if, if you don't mind, I will start with Olivia uh, and then go to Diana and then come to Theonila and Usha for the third question. Uh, Olivia, you have the floor now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Surya, and many thanks to the listeners and viewers for these very interesting questions. I look forward to the answers of my panelists. I, I think it's um, extremely welcome that we are now thinking about how to go beyond what we've achieved with the guiding principles on business and human rights in 2011. Um, of course, the guiding principles on business and human rights were based on an original approach to the respective roles of states, governments on the one hand, and corporations on the other hand, in fulfilling the promise of human rights with the um, uh, protect, respect, remedy framework that is well known. But I think now we have to think what specific contribution corporations can make to um, a world that is uh, better compliant with human rights beyond the minimum requirement not to infringe upon human rights, the requirement to respect human rights inter alia by practicing due diligence. And I think we need to think in three directions. Firstly, there is a big elephant in the room when we discuss the contribution of corporations to the fulfillment of human rights, and that is tax avoidance and tax abuse. Companies resorting to um, uh, to, to tax optimization strategies that sometimes are um, illegal or quasi-illegal, at least violating the spirit of taxation law, are depriving states from public revenue that states require in order to provide services to their population, 
and uh, therefore to fulfill human rights. And in fact, this also has gender impacts. As we know, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Committee, found that, for example, Switzerland, by maintaining a tax haven, was violating the rights of women because it meant that corporations would be paying less um, uh, money in the public coffers in the states in which they operate, thus um, um, not allowing public services to be developed and thus alleviating uh, the burden for, for women. So I think one first um, um, uh, guiding principles on business and human rights plus um, might be in the field of, of tax avoidance and tax optimization strategies. The second area it concerns, and that is a direct answer to the question that was posed, the new business models that companies should gradually develop. Um, some states refer to this as the social and solidarity economy. Others use the term of third sector, which is what is um, used in the UK and the US, for example. Basically, it means that companies increasingly should move beyond strictly profit-driven considerations, profit-driven models, to models driven by other concerns. For example, environmental sustainability. We have had just a few days ago, on 26th of May, uh, the, district, the District Court of The Hague in the Netherlands that has found Shell to be liable um, uh, for climate change impacts of its activities and has um, considered that Shell should move towards um, climate neutrality, reducing its greenhouse gas emissions from its own operations and from the operations of its um, uh, supply chain. Um, and the court, in this case, that was filed by some environmental NGOs and some 17,000 individuals who had signed up to this case, um, the court considered that the OECD guidelines and the UN guiding principles were um, an unwritten standard of care that Shell should um, take into account. So that's one example of a company being required to do more than um, simply to abstain from infringing human rights, although, of course, um, the human rights impacts of climate change are well known. Um, we can also expect from companies in these new business models that are emerging to contribute more to social inclusion. And that goes directly to my mandate as Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. I believe corporations should do more to integrate in the workforce people with low levels of qualification, long-term unemployed people, for example, whose knowledge, whose competence comes from the fact that they've lived the very concrete experience of extreme destitution. And companies have a role to play in contributing to social inclusion by providing opportunities to these people. I also believe that companies increasingly should be expected to adopt the principles of what might be called economic democracy, beyond the principle one share, one vote, that is dominant in the way business is organized today, to move to the principle one person, one vote, so that um, the various stakeholders of the company are better represented are better represented in decision making. Third and finally, beyond the area of taxation and these new business models, I believe we should ask how companies can better contribute to improving the situation of the communities in the areas in which these companies operate. Community development um, should be part of what can be expected from companies, um, how the investor can improve um, education, health, employment opportunities in the areas in which they operate, I think should be a question on the agenda for the future. In other terms, I think the guiding principles on business and human rights were very important when they were adopted to send the message that companies could not ignore human rights and that states should impose on companies that they comply with human rights. But now we must be much more um, focused on the effective impact of community of corporations on communities on climate change on social inclusion and so forth and design new um, human rights principles applying to companies that relate more directly more closely to what companies actually do and that would be my my proposals for this next stage in the discussion on on business and human rights
Many thanks, Surya. Th thank you very much, Olivier. And uh, I think that is uh, what uh, separates this session from the other sessions of the forum, because we are inviting thought leaders. And I think Olivier precisely highlighted some of those futuristic ideas in the business and human rights discourse. And if I read you right, Olivia, you are saying that the responsibility to respect human rights is the floor, but it will not be enough. Businesses would also need to protect and fulfill human rights and achieve just and inclusive growth for everyone. And I think that is where your idea of uh, uh, climate justice, tax avoidance, the social inclu inclusiveness that you highlighted, and more importantly, the economic democracy principle, right, that you highlighted. And, and if I could bring in here, we should be asking the question, uh, why the chief executive officer of a company is earning 600 times more than the worker in the company? So the company can do human rights due diligence day in, day out. How do we bridge this gap? So I think going forward, we should be asking these tough questions and futuristic questions if we really want to achieve sustainable development goals. So thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, Dinah, uh, I would like to now come back to you. Uh, and uh, if you recall, the questions were about incentives for SMEs, informal economy, uh, I welcome your thoughts and you can be bold and ambitious as as you would want to be because we are setting the scene for the next 20 30 years and that is what I would hope for from Usha and Theonila as well in the next round of questions. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, Soria and I will try to be uh, as bold and uh, ambitious uh, when sharing my ideas. So we, we do get a lot of these uh, questions around how can we actually expect uh, SMEs to still incorporate responsible business practices into their operations with such limited resources? And so really, it is a huge uh, barrier for them. But I think if we look at it from, like I said, an ecosystem, we can provide certain incentives. For example, uh, the, the bigger companies who are buyers of, uh, of this uh, SMEs, they can provide incentives to prioritize uh, those uh, SME suppliers who are compliant or at least aligned with their practices around responsible, uh, being responsible businesses, right? So patronizing those kinds of suppliers can definitely become an incentive for SMEs to become uh, responsible business practices. And, and uh, in terms of the government, uh, I think uh, the government is always thinking, oh, is that going to cost us, you know, tax uh, payer dollars or pesos to, to be able to support SMEs, but uh, that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, certain incentives can come in the form of uh, process uh, improvements, fast tracking, these kinds of, um, of uh, requirements that SMEs uh, need to get from uh, government agencies if they actually qualify because of their responsible uh, business practices. So those things are definitely also uh, important um, kind of incentives that SMEs, they, they really value those uh, things as well. And um, in terms of, uh, of uh, also the, the end consumers and how they can incentivize SMEs to be responsible with their practices by, uh, by trying to all, also uh, get their products, right, and, and supporting them because it's very important for uh, these SMEs to to uh, become, uh, to, to, to develop that market and, and be able to say that, hey, you know, responsible business practice actually does uh, make sense for us uh, from a business perspective because consumers are, are, um, are supporting us uh, by, by uh, buying our products. And uh, finally, in terms of the informality, uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, employees, employees themselves, those who are talented and really uh, who are uh, motivated workers, they tend not to go and work for uh, SMEs. Uh, in, in the Philippines, about 95% of companies are technically considered SMEs. When they don't uh, believe they are, uh, they have these uh, good practices when it comes to treating their employees, including not being able to provide them uh, with opportunities 
students to become regular employees, right? So uh, in essence, that becomes an incentive for SMEs to, to uh, elevate their practices so that they can they are able to tap into this really uh, good talent, right? Uh, and, and be able to get productive employees and, and that becomes a really good uh, source of competitive advantage, even for SMEs that, that can really drive uh, the performance of of their organization. So I think those are like really uh, simple incentives that can be provided to SMEs. So hopefully even the SMEs can become, uh, you know, responsible businesses uh, in, the, in, in the near future. Thank you, Surya. Thank you very much, Dana, for these uh, practical suggestions that you highlighted. Uh, and I will encourage uh, more questions from the participants because as you can see, uh, we can't see each other. Uh, uh, probably you can see me, but I can't see the participants. But you can be assured that once you post questions, they come to me and I will take those questions and pose it to the panelists. So I welcome more questions. Uh, so Theonila, uh, the question for you is about uh, communities, right? Uh, what can UN agencies do to protect the rights of UN agencies, uh, including uh, the tribal communities, indigenous communities, so if you want to respond to that question and i will have a similar question for usha as well after you thank you uh thank you Surya, and i will be able to answer the question in two parts because uh, given that the situation that i come from is very much we um i'm in between like you know in a in a juncture where there's legacy agenda which has been long neglected by the issue of um, companies operating. And then here we are at the juncture where we'd like to also go into venture into business in a, in a new kind of a way that will benefit the people more. So on the legacy issue front, we already have human rights and health issues that's challenging the people as we speak. And what I would I would ask the United Nation, Nations uh, organizations to support the people and the indigenous communities is very much to support the voice of the locals so the people to grow, I mean, support us in a way that we call on to the responsible companies to be able to take up the responsibility and and then be able to come in and then find solutions to the ongoing problems which is something that's beyond the capacity of the local people and the indigenous group of people groups of people who are continuing to suffer the aftermath or the impacts of what has happened in the profitable mines that happened in the last 17 years of Bougainville and has been neglected for the next 20 years, which has now become a big issue on, on Bougainville and communities. And that's on the legacy front. I would ask, ask and request the group, I mean, United Nations to come in and support the voice of the little people in the communities. But on the current case, what I would appreciate if the United Nations can be part of us to come into our communities and be able to educate people, not just about the human rights, but the impacts. Because at the moment, as I see what's happening in Bougainville, I see that we just thought on 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 the on the human rights, but on educating people on how to manage their resources and how the resource extractivity can be able to, in the event that you, our people open up to make business with different corporate companies, then how can that benefit the people in the long run, but not just in the, in the given 15 years or 10 years, but how will they be able to find their lives living amid the aftermath of what could happen in the future and also the importance of what i see in my with my people on bougainville i see that there is absence of people being educated on the importance of pre-prior and informed consent 
so so far as we speak there are so many companies that are interested to come into bougainville because of the different resources that we have but and we also have the different united nations agencies on bougainville but i don't see as a as a mandated person by the people to represent the people's voice in the government i do not see the agencies of the united nations engaging with people on educating them on what other impacts that will come about if in the event that you engage and also i would appreciate if the agencies of the united nations can also be able to support the people in bringing out the reputations of the companies because some companies that will that are now coming into pacific are companies that have had bad reputation in the african continent for example so as you you, you and being the global peace organization in order to ensure that there is peace in in melanesia in bougainville in pacific we we got to really we really need united nation agencies to become real protectors when it comes to little people who are at the receiving end of what the companies okay. are doing especially given that we are limited especially on the literacy front so these are the kind yeah. of just literacy on the reading and writing front but on politics economy and basically everything i think that's basically how sure. i can answer the question thank you that, that, that is excellent and i think uh, there, there there are no little people when it comes to human rights all of us are the same and i think you that's why you are here you are in this panel of thought leaders and uh, UN agencies are uh, here to amplify your voice uh, globally, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I'm sure UN agencies who are co-organizing this event, they will take note of uh, your expectations uh, and, and, and that is for them to respond later on. But thank you for highlighting it. Before I go to Usha, and again, the same question for you about the communities, and if you can also bring in uh, what you would like to see differently being done, Usha, in the next one decade, next 20 years, uh, I would like you to address that question, Usha. But before I do that, I'm, I'm going to read two questions that have come for specifically for Olivia uh, so that he can prepare in advance. So, Olivia, one question for you is that what might be the role of organized labor unions in moving businesses forward towards the new sustainable business models because you talked about the new business models which are more sustainable right so what role do you see for the organized uh, unions in that second question uh, is uh, perhaps more ambitious uh, and i will read it uh, if the intention barrier is overcome hypothetically how can companies overcome the ability barrier including fringe stakeholders into their supply chains after all with more organizational capacity to create social value intentions to bring about such change get reinforced so olivia these are the two questions for you i will give you the floor later uh, but now i would like to come back to usha and usha just to repeat the question is uh, what can the governments un do to support the communities on the ground and what would you like to do going forward what bhr challenges you see and how to tackle those challenges differently going forward usha you have the floor thank you i think usha you may be on mute i don't know i can't hear you again I still cannot hear you. It should be okay now. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, so I was just saying now that you've given me the floor, I'm going to take the liberty of going back actually to the question of the corporation, which uh, Olivia answered. Uh, and because I have a slightly different perspective and I would really like that perspective also to be placed on the table. Just as a pre uh, as preliminary comments, I would say that the idea of limited liability and the idea of externalities have been two things that have allowed corporations to get away with a great amount of wrongdoing and with a lot of destruction and a lot of the 
problems that we have in relation to climate change, in relation to impoverishment, in relation to the kinds of discrimination that these policies have brought in. I think these need to be completely revisited. I think we're also seeing during this time, you know, when we are seeing pharma companies battling, saying that never mind if people are dying all around the world, we don't want intellectual property uh, in, uh, you know, in pharmaceutical products to be taken away, especially now that we know that many of these have been built on public money and public resources and public knowledge. Uh, this is something that needs to be directly addressed because it's not just about profit. It's about something way beyond profit. It's about control of whole populations. And that's really not, I mean, that's a very dangerous way to go. But I also want to say that, you know, companies are built for a certain purpose. So a steel making company knows to make steel. I would really be, uh, I mean, I wouldn't want them to expand themselves to taking over some of the responsibilities that the state has, like education, like health, like food distribution, like security of various kinds. And I also say this because, you know, in India, we have this uh, idea of CSR, from, you know, corporate social responsibility being built into the law, where a certain percentage of the tax actually doesn't get paid, but it becomes a corpus for the company itself to do this, you know, to do this work. It is a way of the state shrugging off its responsibility and saying, you have the money, I'm not collecting it as tax, now you go and do what it is that you need to do in that community. We've seen the privatization of these uh, responsibilities too, and that's really not okay. I would ask for guarding against it. And when you read about, you know, there, there are many books that have come now on, uh, who, you know, why is it that companies are the way they are? There's a book, for instance, um, on caste and the technology, I mean, the caste and the, the engineering world and the kind of education that you have, which means that many people, many kinds of people, many, you know, many people with different identities are left out of the system. And we are asking those who have trained themselves in a certain way now to take charge of the well being of all those people that it has not included into their own companies. And I really don't think that's okay. I mean, I think we should be very, very cautious before we start apportioning state responsibilities to corporations. I really think it's a bad idea. I also want to say that in that context, that the way philanthropy has gone is scary. There is extraordinary amounts of inequality and those who've made huge sums of money, I mean, unbelievable sums of money in a very short while, while especially technology companies and technology, you know, people who are controllers of technology companies who are telling us that they are giving us everything for free, but they are becoming rich on it. And we really need to understand what kind of a context this is. Now, those philanthropists have ambitions where they say they will deal with climate change. I think Mr. Gates, for instance, has said that he is working on a project to darken the sun, to dim the sun. I mean, this is not just tampering with democracy. This is, this is I don't know who gives who the permission to start dealing with nature in this kind of a way. I, I think we need to go back and look at what philanthropy means, especially in the kind uh, in the context of the kind of inequalities we have. On the question, what, what I see as the uh, issues that are going to come up, I think the legacy issues we carry on our back, they are burdens that we have to carry and we have to deal with, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, tribal lands being taken away, forests being decimated, uh, you know, and the environment being plundered because of this idea of development, whether it's the legacy that Bhopal has left us. But there are new things that have come up recently. And we keep saying, you know, that, uh, like I said, 1984 was one Bhopal, and now, I've, uh, yeah, it was Bhopal. And the other 1984 is really this panoptican that we are creating. You know? So the three kinds of things, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, 90, uh, George Orwell's 1984 and Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon kind of encapsulates the kind of world we have entered. This world has technology with a certain two kinds of imagination. One kind of imagination is where private companies become huge. Silicon Valley is a classic example where then they start providing us with, service, with services, they entertain us, they keep us occupied, they use psychology to, you know, to manipulate our interests and our time. And they also make us burn our boats so that we can't, you know, we, we have nowhere else to go back to. And these have produced systems of datafication of people. 
It has produced surveillance systems. It has fed into the idea of the security state. It manipulates not just people's minds, but also democracies. And so something that is enchanting for us, like you know, walking around with a smartphone and being able to talk to anybody you want, has actually become a threat alongside being an enchantment. That's why Brave New World. They keep us entertained while they take everything away. And I think this is now an open problem. There is the other kind of imagination is the kind of imagination we see in our countries where everybody has to be put onto databases. Every, you know, and it's done by making, by the kind of conversation which says that uh, people are suspect. And so you have to keep proving yourself. You could be a fraudulent person who's going and collecting food from the food security shop that has been kept there for you. So you have to prove yourself every time. So actually in India, for instance, we found that the poor have lost more rights in this process because they have to use biometrics to collect their food, you know, what, what, what their entitlement is. And the biometrics may, not, may or may not work. And if it works, it's one kind of problem. If it doesn't, it's another. Now we have moved on in biometrics to facial recognition, which threatens a, a number of, uh, you know, human rights and fundamental rights in our countries. So I think the, the charm that, you know, the charmed life that technology seems to be offering us has, has, you know, that it's fallen off. And we are, what we've seen over the past 10, 15 years is the deliberate assassination of one specific right, which is the right to privacy. And now we are seeing the, you know, intrusion into a range of other rights, including the right to protest, the, in, you know, including the right to assemble peaceably without arms, including the right to communicating with each other without having the state or the corporation or anyone coming into it. Uh, and this is going to be a huge issue. I think if we don't confront it today, uh, in its, you know, and I will, I'll stop at this last word that the unfortunate thing that I see is that uh, the UN has become a part of this whole exercise. So you have a committee that is set up, which is going to look at uh, identity systems around the world. So they've reduced the right to identity to the right, you know, to having an identity, uh, to, to being on a database and to having, you know, a biometric identity. And the UN has uh, a committee which is peopled by people who have an, uh, uh, in a company interest in these systems. So you'll have Melinda Gates as the head of that, uh, you know, of that uh, committee. You'll have the World Bank, which has people like Mr. Nilakani who have pushed this on, on to the poor, especially, but to the whole population. So I think the UN needs to sit back and take stock of who it wants to consult and what is considered conflict of interest. Okay. Th thank you very much, Usha, for these thought-provoking ideas. And I think I liked your assassination of the right to privacy. Uh, and if I could add to that, uh, in the COVID times, even the right to protest has been assassinated. <laughs> so privacy as well as right to protest, I guess, in many parts of the world. Uh, all right, so we have about 20 minutes left. Uh, so I would encourage now the panelists to be a little bit briefer uh, because I would like to give all of you uh, chances to respond to that. I, I would like to start with Diana. And before I go to Olivia for those questions, uh, Diana, it, it is becoming very clear that despite the progress that we have made in the last 10 decades, the last 20 years, we need to make much more progress and at a faster pace much more systemic, transformative, and fundamental progress going forward. But who can do it? We need business leaders, right? And you teach at a business school. So my question to you is, what is the role of business leaders being coming out of the business schools? Uh, how can we uh, nurture those business leaders who can respond to ambitious agenda set by Olivia and Usha and all those uh, Theonil and, and including yourself, right? And, and any advice you have for companies, how they should not repeat the mistakes that we see, whether it's Bougainville, whether it's Bhopal, whether it's Shell, or all over the world. We have our own, uh, these case studies all over the world, right? So what should businesses do differently going forward? And if you can be precise, uh, that will be much appreciated. Thank you. It's 
I'll go ahead after Olivier, right, Surya? No, no, you, you can go now, in fact, uh, if you don't oh, mind. Or, or, or do you want me to, it's up to you. Uh, do you want time? Then I can go to Olivia. Yeah, I think Olivia. You want to gather be, your thoughts? Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Olivia, uh, are you ready with those two questions that came from the virtual floor? Uh, would you be able to answer those two questions uh, briefly now? Many thanks, Surya. Uh, I I shall be brief because I, I shall answer one of the two questions. I did not really, unfortunately, understand the second one. But the first one was on unions and the role that they could play. I think it's a very important question. Unions are, it seems to me, an underestimated part of the solution of these um, um, uh, game-changing solutions that we are now um, looking for beyond the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And unions, it seems to me, have two important roles to play. First, um, it seems to me that the transnational organization of labor, in other terms, the development of global unions, bringing together different local unions from the same corporate group or from, from one and the same sector, can be a very important counterweight to the risks associated with economic globalization. Economic globalization, in fact, for companies means quite simply that they can choose where to put workers to work, where to pollute, where to pay their taxes. If indeed they pay taxes at all, they can choose where to declare profits. And so economic globalization can be extremely uh, problematic if it is used in this opportunistic way by, by corporations. Now, the organization of global unions is one way to counteract this um, tendency. And the best example is the development of international framework agreements concluded between global unions and uh, multinational um, uh, enterprises that try to, in fact, mitigate the competition between the different suppliers of the same corporate group in order to avoid those most uh, problematic consequences of global supply chains. In the future, I believe that international framework agreements could be strengthened, contribute more and better to improving the working conditions of um, workers in two ways. First of all, not only by creating um, space for local collective bargaining processes to take place, not only by focusing on the, the, the principles of the 1998 ILO Declaration on Principles and Rights at Work, which for the most part these international framework agreements do, but also by introducing in global supply chains and across the activities of the corporate group the requirement of a living wage having to be paid to workers and the requirement that all workers will enjoy the full range of social protection warranties that are stipulated in the idea of social protection floors, also pioneered by the International Labour Organization. So that is the first way in which unions can contribute to our discussion by this transnational organization of labour and the work of global unions. Secondly, much more briefly, unions can promote indeed economic democracy um, by uh, insisting that, as the ILO um, constitution says, labour is not a commodity and that instead workers should have a say in the strategic decisions companies make by um, having a requirement for all these strategic decisions, not only that shareholders accept certain proposals or make certain choices, but also that workers are consulted and co-design the strategies of the big company. And I think that would be one way, certainly, to ensure that companies do more to contribute to the SDGs and to um, uphold human rights in the future. Many thanks, Surya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier, for also providing a concrete suggestion in terms of how these unions can counter the multinationals going forward in terms of the global economy. So that, that is very much appreciated. Uh, before I go to Diana, I would like to read two comments, uh, not questions, but comments so that came from the participants. Uh, one comment is directed at UN agencies, uh, and the comment is that the Bougainville case history highlights the complicity between the state and the companies. 
and the comment is that that is that that shows that the un agency should be more proactive in engagement to break the cycle of complicity and there is a comment uh, on my comment and usha's comment <laughs> so comment on a comment and, and that comment is that if both privacy and the right to protest have been assassinated as we provocatively said usha and myself then we have lost both the private and public spheres we are all in that sense, if no other, marginalized, pushed to the margins. Uh, no time to react, but uh, I wanted to bring those comments as well to this discussion. Uh, Dinah, you have the floor. Uh, you already know the question. And if you can be brief, I will appreciate. Thank you. You have the floor now. Yes, uh, when it comes to nurturing uh, business leaders, like you said, uh, Surya, let me just uh, go ahead and let you know that there is a discussion uh, tomorrow at June 2 at 5 p.m. when it comes to reimagining business school education with responsible management and human rights. So um, this will be uh, amongst a panel of uh, uh, professors in business schools, uh, like uh, you mentioned. And so anybody who's very interested in how we're trying to imagine this is definitely welcome to, to go into that uh, discussion, which will be uh, going to be uh, discussed in depth. And uh, when it comes to companies learning uh, about uh, their mistakes, I think um, th there is an opportunity to partner with uh, organizations like, uh, like my Center for Corporate Responsibility, where we partner with international organizations, uh, OECD, ILO, UN, uh, including UN WIP, to, to, to bring these frameworks uh, into the Philippines and, and really help companies to, to transform and to become responsible businesses. And, and, and they do need these kinds of um, partnerships that are uh, based on uh, internationally accepted uh, standards to up their game. And, and they really need to also do that because they need to, to be ahead of the curve as, uh, as their consumers, as their buyers from abroad, as their employees are actually uh, coming to expect these uh, practices that respect the human rights uh, of, of their different stakeholders. And, and so I think uh, companies need to wake up to this uh, new reality and really become honest with some of those practices that they are having uh, difficulties in transforming and, and looking at really quality help that they can get. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of help is out there and, and, and they just need to make sure that they realize how important it is uh, to transform and so that we can all uh, we can all contribute to, to improving this uh, the situations and, and I think you and uh, Usha mentioned uh, a lot of those uh, potential pitfalls and, and so once we get everybody to become self-aware about those I think uh, we can really move uh, fast and, and uh, gain a definite uh, progress around these kinds of issues. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, there is a question that I'm going to throw to all of you. Anyone can pick that question. It's an open question. The question is that what advice can you give to stop governments from approving, uh, let us say, development projects? Uh, the question says high-rise buildings, but I will frame it more broadly as development projects, which may damage the oceans, rivers, lakes, uh, natural parks, Ridges and all that, right? So basically, it's 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 an issue about the conflict between development and the environment and human rights on the other hand, which which is being very vividly highlighted by some of you in different interventions. So probably towards the end, uh, if anyone would like to respond to that question, that would be very much appreciated. Now uh, we have about ten minutes left, and I would like to bring the second video that uh, Theonila had uh, pre-recorded. And in that video, uh, she is uh, trying to highlight her wish list. Uh, what what is that the Bougainville community would like the relevant governments and the communities, sorry, the companies, uh, in, in particular Rio Tinto, to do? in terms of redressing this legacy and going forward, what should they do differently? So if uh, the technical team could play the second video now, that will be very much appreciated. And I will come back to the panelists after this video. Rio Tinto must clean up the mess it made. They developed the mine. They operated it with their subsidiary, Bougainville Copper Limited. They made the decision to release all the mine waste into our rivers, 
instead of storing and disposing it in safer ways. So they're responsible for providing remedy. This situation must be addressed before we in Bougainville can move on as a people and as a new nation. In 2019, Bougainville people voted overwhelmingly for independence. And yet, we have this legacy hanging over our shoulder and this huge problem left by the mining operation. We have called on the company. I think uh, the video stopped somehow. I can't. Oh, oh, you cannot play it anymore. Okay, so that that's fine. Uh, Theonila, I don't know if you want to add something because somehow the video we could not complete it. Uh, I think we got the initial message of the video, but I don't know if you want to add something to that, uh, or you can think about it. I can go to some other speakers and uh, come back to you. What will you prefer? Do you want to speak now, or uh, you want to take some time? Uh, I think you're on, you're on mute. Yeah. So the technologies, I mean now. technologies, technologies can also assassinate our right to speech because someone can be muted, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so on, on this, from this lighter moment to more serious <laughs> issue of legacy, you have the floor now, uh, Theony. Yes. Yeah, so just continuing on from where the video is cut, um, we have called on to the company to urgently commit a funding on an environmental assessment of the mine to properly clean up and assist our people where the human rights needs, needs have been violated. We need solutions to stop the waste from continuing to destroy new areas of land and we and our accessibility to clean water health services we are we need help in restoring our natural environment through reforestation as well which is the least we can do these are solutions that are beyond the resources our people can use to fix with our bare hands at the moment it is not yet clear what rio tinto will do we are still in discussion with the company and we hope that this will lead into real actions that can actually set precedents for every other companies operating in the Pacific and our global community as well. We also expect that the companies and the governments throughout the world and our region as well, including our own government, to learn from such disasters that have been happening, and specifically in the Bougainvillean community. These impacts and challenges we are living with were imposed on us and through the laws that were written to protect the interests of the extractive industry. There must, we must make sure that going forward in Bougainville, we do not fall into this trap again. And this is a call to every other brothers and sisters in the global community, especially in the Pacific Asian region. We must make sure that our laws protect our human our re human rights, our environment and people's rights now when those are yet to be born, including the rights of the communities and the landowner to better find a way forward as we move going into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Theonila. And I hope uh, not only Rio Tinto, but all businesses including in the extractive sectors. They are listening to uh, the, the past legacy issues, so whether this is Bhopal or Bougainville, or this is Rana Plaza, or this is uh, the Brazil Dam or Laos. I mean, there's endless number of case studies from all over the world. Mm. And I hope businesses learn lessons and, and do their best that these things are not repeated again. All right, so uh, panelists, uh, and participants, I hope you have been enjoying this conversation and dialogue with the thought leaders. We have just five minutes left. Uh, and I would like to give all the four uh, thought leaders 60 seconds each. I, I know uh, that may not be enough, but we just have one minute for uh, each one of you. Any final thoughts, 
any final reflections anything that you would like to say and you have not been able to say and uh, may i start with uh, olivia then i will go to usha then i will go to dina and i will end up with Hionila in this order okay so olivia uh, your 60 second starts now thank you many many thanks surya i i believe we need to think about a model of development that does not invest all its hopes into economic growth. Um, for the moment, governments have been terribly lacking imagination. All problems, it seems, have to be solved by creating more wealth in order to uh, tax that wealth and to um, redistribute resources and finance public services. But growth has been not only extremely impossible to reconcile with the environmental emergency, but also in the name of growth, we've been liberalizing trade, we've been favoring a, a, a business-friendly environment, uh, investment climate, which means basically lowering taxes on corporations. We've also allowed corporations to uh, get a free hand in the kind of practices they they have and i think we need to think a development model that does not rely on growth as its key tool to achieve everything else we need an inclusive kind of economy that um, seeks to promote well-being happiness rather than growth and um, and and increase of affluence and i think that is the start of it all until we move away from this dominant growth centered paradigm it will be very difficult to reconcile um, uh, business with human rights. Thank you. That's that's a very powerful and uh, a message with which I agree, uh, Olivier. Uh, I, I would have to say, so I can't disagree. Uh, Usha, your 60 seconds. Uh, so the first thing is on the advice that was asked about uh, what we do with these development projects. I think I just want to say that, you know, the one thing that has provided the friction has been people's action. And that's why dissent is being cracked on upon so much, because people's action has actually you know, changed. At least it has, it's helped us raise all these questions and think of all of this and make people answerable to the extent that's possible. We have, for instance, a site called Land Conflict Watch, which tells us why land has become so difficult for a corporation to just get for a, or for a state to just take away. So they then move to the blue economy, to the ocean, and start exploiting the ocean. On the other hand, we have this idea of data. And in our country, and I suspect in a lot of the developing world, we'll have a different problem from what Snowden said. Snowden said that the American government was secretively taking all the information about people. Here, we are being forced to part with our information. The state says that they want to make use it for a data economy. So it's no longer our right, but it is the requirement of the state. I, I, you know, since it's a minute, there's just one thing that I want to end with to say that till we learn to drop the idea of exploitation of resources and go back to the idea of use of resources, we are going to get more. And corporations are not trained, nor are the laws made in such a way that they need or that they can survive on use. They need exploitation, which is why we need a fundamental change very good so with that message for a transformative change from exploitation to the only use what is needed to survive uh dinah your one minute thank you yes sorry yeah. and just building on what the uh, olivier and usha has mentioned i believe that uh, when it comes to discussing this trade-offs between development or growth objectives and social objectives we really need to have a true multi-stakeholder engagement and and so uh, a lot of the uh, international organizations, ILO has this tripartite uh, uh, model for consulting their uh, their stakeholders, employers, employees, and government. Uh, the OECD's uh, due diligence uh, guidance also incorporates uh, multi-stakeholder engagement at every step of the way when it comes to transforming uh, the practices of uh, businesses to become more responsible. And so I think we can also use technology in a more positive way 
by uh, using it to, to be able to listen to these different voices and, and to really get them uh, to, to incorporate them in a lot of the decision making that we're doing so that we can have a true multi-stakeholder engagement that is built in to a lot of these processes. Excellent. Both points excellence that we need to work together. Uh, at the same time, the technologies can also be used in a positive manner, right? And I think this session is a good example of it. Without technology, we could not have had this conversation virtually. Uh, Theonila, very quickly, you have the last words. Uh, if you can share anything quickly. Okay. Um, I think since this panel is on our responsible business and human rights, and we've talked so much about many things, I would like to, on a very practical basis, call on all the panelists, the United Nations agencies and other human, uh, other impacted communities throughout the Pacific region to stand with me in solidarity on the call to get real Tinto become responsible and accountable on the legacy issue on Bougainville. Because if together as a global community, we can make real Tinto become responsible in fixing its legacy matters, every other corporate companies in the world as, or will also become responsible and be human rights conscious. That's a message I can give. Thank you very much, Tionila. That was a message very loud and clear, and I hope uh, the relevant people are listening to that. So, so uh, panelists, uh, it was a privilege for me to moderate this uh, excellent discussion. Participants, I hope you enjoyed it, uh, and I will encourage all of you to uh, tune in to the rest of the sessions today and the rest of the week. So with this, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists once again uh, for joining this session and all the participants for engaging and asking questions. It has been a pleasure. And also I would like to thank the technical team and of course, all the organizers who pulled this session together. So bye for now from my side, uh, take care, stay safe and continue the fight.